Okay. You ready? I'm good. Let's do it. Go! <laughs> Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Dr. Adrian Saville. He's the CEO and founder of Canon Asset Management in South Africa. He's also a professor of economics at the University of Pretoria. He's got some fascinating ideas and I'm looking forward to having a chat with him right after this. <laughs> Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquire's Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquire's Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquire's Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Adrian. How are you? I'm good, Tobias. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me onto the podcast and the, the time with you. My absolute pleasure. I should say in the interests of full disclosure that we recorded a podcast yesterday and I lost the file. So this is not <laughs> this is not the podcast. This is a tribute to the podcast. But we're, we're going to do our best to recreate the magic that we had yesterday. Second time better. Uh, tell us a little bit about your Super Dogs portfolio. Superdog started really as a, I guess, an academic curiosity where in the mid 1990s, I, I wondered uh, what would happen if I built a portfolio of uh, unloved but good businesses. Uh, and you know, I think it's uh, academically honest to, to describe it exactly that uh, as that. It wasn't that I had some spectacular foresight or strong inkling of, of what I would get. I, I really did just wonder uh, what, what would happen uh, if I put together this portfolio. And I constructed in, uh, for the first time, 1996, a, a highly diversified portfolio uh, made up of financial and industrial companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange with, uh, with really just two criteria for inclusion. Uh, the first was that the business had to be profitable, and the second was that it had to be unloved. And drawing then from a wide range of industries, all the way from engineering and electronics through to uh, banking and insurance, uh, I constructed uh, that first portfolio, and it happened to have a spectacular year, and the curiosity turned into intrigue. Oh, how, how big was the first year? First year was a 34% return, uh, which I guess you know in any uh, in any environment is uh, is notable. It was against a, a market return of just two and a half percent. So, you know, I'm not sure if we're allowed to use the word alpha uh, in this conversation. <laughs> you can use <laughs> it. There's a lot of alpha there. Market, <laughs> but relative to market, it was it was just an absolutely extraordinary result. Um, you know people, our industry scratches around for uh, a few basis points or modest percentages and to have banked that in, in the first year led me to, uh, to repeat the exercise in year two, it was followed by a second year of really healthy returns, 21% in the second year. Uh, and that has been sort of the practice from then. Superdogs is now uh, a 24-year-old portfolio. And uh, you've averaged about 19.8% versus 13.9% for the broader index, which is almost four points of, of outperformance, which is extraordinary over, over a very extended period of time. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you're defining unloved or how you were defining unloved initially? Well, initially, uh, it was that the business had to be profitable, uh, which would, I guess, infer or it could be inferred that it was unfairly uh, unloved or perhaps it, it could at least justify a tiny bit of love but the unlovedness was captured by a single metric price earnings multiple with the benefit of hindsight that single metric is narrow and naive uh, and have be, having been a very keen follower and enthusiastic reader of your work uh, you know, I don't need to tell you that we could easily have refined that to a far more sophisticated metric 
but that's where we started. Uh, it needed to have positive earnings, low price relative to those earnings, and we were away. Over the years, we've added components to that. Uh, very early on, we added dividend yield, uh, which required then that the earnings were underpinned by distribution. We then added uh, price book, uh, which suggested that there was a balance sheet behind the earnings. And global financial crisis in particular uh, implored us to add a quality component. And what's your, what's your quality component? How are you defining quality? Range of factors go into, into quality. We start with uh, a forensic tool, uh, which I think is relatively unique to, to the industry. In version one of our podcast, we didn't speak about this. Uh, so it's great to be sharing some new content with you. Uh, but we start with a forensic tool, which uh, really goes on the recognition that if it's garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Uh, and uh, if there is accounting error or accounting fraud, uh, in any business analysis, you really are just working with a fiction. Uh, so over the last 20 years or so, we've built a, uh, I think, a fairly sophisticated and quite powerful uh, tool that helps us identify the quality of numbers. And once we're satisfied that we're working with robust figures, we then start to move into strength of balance sheet, quality of operating performance, uh, stability of operating performance, never confusing accounting profit with cash flow uh, profit. Uh, the first is a result of a whole bunch of rules. The second is uh, a result of business performance. So we're, we're not after accounting earnings, we're after cash flow earnings. Uh, and the way in which we sort of at a headline level uh, measure business performances through tools like uh, jo uh, Joseph Piotrowski's F-score would be an example. And uh, uh, you've refined that over the years. I actually don't mind price to cash flow, uh, price to earnings as, as a metric. I think it's underrated because one of the things it does, it looks for, you have to be profitable in the first instance for, yeah. it, to, for it to have a price to earnings ratio. And then it's a flow. I, I think it's a pretty good metric, but naturally you have to add quite a lot more onto it. Um, I've read that you have, in some of the, the collateral that you sent to me, you have four key elements uh, as part of your process. Could you just discuss those briefly? Uh, sure. So, the, you know, the first attribute is to, is to look for uh, value uh, in, in an entity. Value can be measured in, in a range of ways. Uh, uh, price earnings is a point of departure, and that was our very first jump off point uh, now 20, <laughs> almost 25 years ago. Uh, you can add to that dividend yield, price book, price cash flow. Uh, so we work with uh, a range of uh, metrics and tools and measures to identify the inherent or intrinsic value uh, in a business, not valuing it or valuation, just to ask from what you see, what you get, uh, is, there, uh, is there worth uh, in the enterprise? We happen to uh, include in that a Ben Graham uh, tool, which over the years has flagged for us uh, a, a useful number of Ben Graham net nets. Uh, we've recently invested in, in one of those in the insurance sector. And by absolute coincidence, about 10 years ago, we found a extremely profitable, fantastically priced uh, Ben Graham net net that went on to be uh, a classic 10 bagger for us, a company called Conduit Capital. Um, the second uh, attribute is to, you know, is to look for the, uh, the quality of the business, re referencing the earlier point, uh, that um, we want to buy good businesses Ideally, we want to buy great businesses, uh, but to borrow in some part from your work, uh, we are very comfortable buying good businesses at great prices. We Ideally, we'd like to buy great businesses at great prices, uh, but very happy buying good businesses at great prices. And quality can be measured in, in a range of ways. The Piotrowski F-score is sort of a headline measure. Uh, cash conversion so that earnings convert to cash flow, that we've got ideally stable margins, stable ROE, stable ROA, relative to, uh, always relative to. Uh, you can't analyze or assess a business in its own right. Uh, and then 
the third attribute from there is to work out what the what the entity what the enterprise is worth uh, and here too we have a range of approaches to think about uh, business valuation and the step four is to from those three uh, pillars construct a portfolio with 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 a range of uh, elements including uh, diversification uh, or concentration that uh, is suited to the mandate that we're building to. One of my favorite portfolios is called Hummingbird. It holds just 10 names. Uh, we build a global uh, equity portfolio that holds just 25 names. It's benchmarked against MSCI All World Index, but it's not trying to mimic the index. It's trying to beat the index by a healthy margin, uh, and we're very comfortable holding a small number of names up against a very diversified global index. Superdogs tends to hold 40 or 50 uh, names. And uh, once we've constructed the portfolio, I think a part of process that very often falls into neglect is the, is the sell process, is managing and monitoring and maintaining the positions that, it, uh, that when something is no longer investable. We have the discipline uh, to remove it from, from the portfolio and we don't land up with long tails or overly diversified portfolios. Uh, so your, your focus is, is value for the most part, but you have you offer some different portfolios through the firm. Uh, could you just take us through the, your, your offering? Sure. Uh, the, the portfolios sit on sort of a a spectrum that ranges from active to passive and from domestic to global. So you can think of, you know, I guess your classic business school two by two. Uh, and in the, uh, in the passive, we're building generally multi-asset portfolios. Uh, those multi-asset portfolios have two imperatives. The one is to mimic or match the asset class that we want to own. And the second is to make sure that costs are out of the system. On the active side of the portfolio uh, spectrum, as you know, names like our Hummingbird uh, will, will suggest, uh, we're, we're quite comfortable, looking very different to market. It's more expensive to run. It has a, a high element of intellectual property in it. And so we will range in our uh, uh, portfolio construction from passive, market matching or asset class matching, multi-asset, all the way through to highly concentrated, high conviction, active. We generally don't hang around in the middle where we, we see the industry tending to crowd and trying to beat each other in what is very often a, a, a one-legged legged person in, uh, I think Charlie Munger put it, a one-legged person in an ass-kicking contest. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we push to either side of the spectrum. Uh, Passive, multi-asset, very low cost, or active, high concentration, high conviction. And then uh, uh, in terms of growth or capital protection, here uh, a far more uh, graduated or phased approach where we will range all the way from uh, uh, robust capital protection or preservation through to income generation or yield, and then at the top of that, uh, that pyramid, capital growth. Your, uh, your market, your passive market index style, it's not, it's not market capitalization weighted, is it you, you, you offer, is it equal, like equal weight or you do offer that as well? We're very often, or not very often, uh, sometimes we're obliged to you know, invest in or hold what's available, uh, especially if it's a modest component of uh, a multi-asset portfolio. An example would be if we're putting in a sort of a global biotech tracker. You know, we might take then what's available uh, and it will be, you know, off the shelf. I don't mean that in an insulting way in any shape or form. There is, there are, there is a fantastic uh, range of solutions available. But where we have the capacity uh, to add investment intelligence or wisdom, we will try and reshape some of those passive solutions. One of my favorite examples is in the South African equity arena, where overwhelmingly the South African equity market is characterized by uh, uh, concentration, so 
uh, a handful of stocks make up 50% of the index, and then a very, very long tail. And our preference is to replace then that skewed uh, and often poorly behaved market-weighted index with an equal-weighted index. And as long as you've got you know, a long enough runway and you're not obsessed by the month-to-month -month or quarter-to-quarter -quarter market return, as functional or dysfunctional as you might regard it, that uh, equal-weighted portfolio tends to produce much better risk-adjusted returns or what I prefer to refer to as results. Uh, just much better investment results than than your in, than your market weighted index. Um, value has struggled globally for about the last decade, and in particular for the last five years. What's the South African experience been? Well, you, you know, you commented uh, initially on some of the collateral I've shared with you, and so you, you know, you've got a good sense of how our super dogs and hummingbird portfolios have done uh, in recent times. The last five years, uh, perhaps even the last 10 years, uh, in sympathy with global uh, value factors, have been tough yards. Global financial crisis, uh, we sort of navigated that in reasonable form. And then there was a rather spectacular recovery from global financial crisis. From then to now, though, and what I'm referring to is sort of 2009, 2010, to roughly now, uh, the value environment in South Africa has been, it's been hard going, tough yards. There's, uh, I think there's a couple of elements that, that explain that. Uh, the one is, as you point out, the, the rather anemic global appetite for, for value, where it's been very much a, a growth on unicorn, uh, low uh, cost of capital environment. Uh, that has been, to add the insult to the injury, South Africa has had, uh, on top of that, a tough domestic economic circumstance. And you'll appreciate value uh, mathematically tends to be small and out of favor. And it happens to be because of the uniquenesses or specific elements going on in South Africa over the last 10 years. <coughs> Uh, it is South African facing businesses that have fallen into value territory and put in a short statement, the appetite just hasn't been there. So you've had lack of global appetite compounded by uh, an even lower domestic appetite for value. The net result is, you know, we, when we construct our super dogs portfolio at the beginning of this year, we're constructing that portfolio on a seven times earnings multiple. And what's the what's the broader market at? Fifteen times. So it's 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 more it's less than half price relative to the to the to the market. We we're trying to pay you know the classic fifty cents in the dollar. Uh, that's exactly what we're looking for. So if we are buying a portfolio of good businesses, dividend paying, strong balance sheets, and we're paying half the earnings multiple, and they have the ability to earnings revert to recapture uh, performance then we have paid 50 cents in the dollar, and that's what our 20-year track record uh, uh, suggests or evidences. Uh, the, the markets that I'm most familiar with, the Australian market has that unusual composition where it's about 50% financials and about 15% basic materials, quite similar to the Canadian market. How is the South African market composed? South Africa, although the economy is... I think regarded and driven by commodity and resource components, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange itself has actually a relatively modest representation of commodity businesses. They make up at the moment about 20% of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. The balancing 80% is made up of financials, 20 to 30%, and then industrials the, uh, is, is the bulk, the heft, uh, 50% of the market. There, there are times when commodities have come to make up a much larger component. At the peak of the resources boom in the noughties decade, commodities made up about half of JSE market cap. And uh, the South African market is a little bit unusual at the moment in that it's got one stock that's it, that's very heavily weighted. But And I think it's a great story too, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but NASPERS <laughs> Naspers to, no, you've got the pronunciation. Uh, to the, uh, Naspers, Absolutely. 
Can you, can you just tell us is. a little bit about the uh, MASPIS? Sure. To, to take a step back, uh, just before we jump into NASPES, you'll appreciate uh, being familiar with Canada, Australia, and the vagaries of commodity uh, cycles. That in itself makes it tough uh, if, you set your, if you set out to beat the market and you've got one component that can be 20% or 50%, depending on the mood. Uh, <laughs> that, that part is bouncing around. And then to add sort of complexity uh, to that already uh, reasonably demanding challenge, you've got industrial concentration. Um, that concentration takes the shape as you flag in the current environment with NUSPAS making up about 20% of the index. That, uh, that company has a long South African history. It's uh, more than 100 years old and starts its life as a, a print uh, media business, printing newspapers. Uh, that's where, it life, uh, where its life starts. And over the years, it has demonstrated a, a characteristic, an innate attribute of being willing to adventure into neighboring industries. And so it's got into book publishing uh, as a case in point, uh, as the South African education system grew. Uh, more recently, through the 1980s and into the 1990s, it went into uh, broadcast media and in particular uh, digital satellite television. Uh, the company that today is separately listed uh, is called DSTV. Very successful, profitable footprint, pan-African uh, in, in, in market reach. And extending that attribute of being sort of a willing venture capitalist or adventure capitalist even. NUSPAS through the 1990s and into the noughties made some modest investments into Chinese uh, uh, e-commerce businesses. One of those ventures led them to acquiring about half of the equity of Tencent, which today is one of the largest uh, e-commerce businesses globally, not just China. And NUSPAS has uh, a substantial uh, economic stake in that business. It, it is translated into NUSPAS being, well, A, 20% of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, but that aside, in and of itself, a spectacularly successful uh, investment for anyone who has been willing and patient to own it for a long time. And what proportion of NUSPAS value is attributable to Tencent? <laughs> You'll love this, Toby. More than 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, you've got... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, it uh, trades at a discount to the underlying. It's been a... Um, it, I've seen them write up quite a few times over the last two or three years at least where uh, you can uh, you have an arbitrage where you can arbitrage Tencent out exactly. of uh, Naspers because Naspers has some other good assets in it, but um, I, I think it's a it's a fascinating story. It's um, it's 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 funny how it has the it, the impact of it has been so huge through the company itself and through the the index. Yeah. So Naspers, as you point out, owns underlying assets. I mentioned DSTV as a case in point. Uh, it has uh, a healthy pile of cash. Uh, uh, I think that much uh, doesn't need explanation. And it's made investments into other businesses, including uh, Mail.ru, uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, it has small stakes in those. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's not, uh, those are interesting. It doesn't characterize a as a as a unicorn investor. It just happens to be that over the way, it's gathered up those positions. And uh, if you uh, paying, a uh, hundred rand for a NAS per share, you're getting about 130 rand in net asset value. Uh, the bulk of that net asset value being explained by by Tencent. So there's a fantastic arbitrage. South Africa has uh, a very sophisticated uh, uh, financial sector, well established, competitive and sophisticated. Uh, and um, Unsurprisingly, then, that financial sector has given birth to NUSPAS uh, residuals. You can buy a stub or the rump uh, of NUSPAS, which gives you uh, exposure to 
whichever component you want. Uh, so lots of ways to be exposed and invested in the core business as well as its satellites. It must make it very difficult to construct a portfolio because you you have to keep your eye on NASPERS all the time because it's, it's such a huge component of the index and you have to make an active decision one way or the other. If you hold it, that's an active decision to be long, even in a, even in a market, you know, even in a passive index, or you have to construct something that, how do you deal with that? Not to be flippant, but you know, one way that you can deal with it is to make a strong argument for an equal weighted index, uh, that there will come a time when NASPERS is no longer 20% uh, of the market. It's hard to know you know what the factors will be that cause that to happen but we you know in our uh, philosophy we we place very little weight or value on forecasting so whilst we don't know what's going to change NASPERS from being a 20 percent factor to much smaller we know that something will change there was a time when anglo-american and bhp bulletin made up 30% of the JSE. They now make up less than 10%. Uh, it was hard to forecast when the global financial crisis would strike, strike but you know, that's what changed it. Uh, so that you, could, you can think about uh, sort of portfolio construction ways of, of dealing with this in terms of your broad rules, market weighted, equal weighted, uh, or you know, we won't step more than X percentage points away or basis points away from whatever the market weight might be to close down tracking errors. So there's lots of ways that you can that you can cope with it. If you want to be ultra active, then you are either going to need to own more than 20% in your portfolio, <laughs> or if you don't like it uh, and you want to be absolutely no dead capital, then you've got to take that beta position from 20 all the way down to zero. Uh, you're going to be spectacularly right or spectacularly <laughs> wrong. It, it, it really does make uh, for a challenging portfolio construction environment, and it has led to fierce and furious debate in our investment team over many, many years. We have not yet solved it. <laughs> so if you would, let's, let's go through some of your positions. Uh, I, we, we discussed several of these yesterday, but I noted them in your collateral as well. Uh, Sabvest, I think is the, mm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Sabvest is, I think it's a, it's a neat company to talk about because uh, I, I've already alluded to South Africa being a well-regulated uh, and relatively sophisticated market. Very often, you know, when people look at mid and smaller sized businesses, their risk radar, you know, immediately goes up. But if you have a, you know, a well-regulated uh, market, then uh, a, a large part of uh, systemic risk, I think, is catered for. And that gives us great comfort in, in exercising what I believe is one of Canon Asset Manager's strong uh, uh, competitive strengths. Uh, and that is the ability to move out of uh, the highly traded uh, larger part of the market. So South Africa has a almost sort of a two-legged market. The first leg is your top 100 companies or so. They tend to be uh, well traded, very liquid, highly researched, uh, and researched not just domestically but uh, uh, globally. Once you've moved outside of that top 100, you're still in companies that have uh, a healthy size and good liquidity, but the the coverage and the extent of research on these businesses, it, it's as if you step off a roadrunner sort of research cliff and nothing happens at stock 101. <laughs> and you're then left with three or 400 stocks, which are in each of their rights, uh, an investment option, but massive uh, information gaps. Or, uh, and I think that's where, you know, just a tiny bit of research and uh, information gathering can actually lead to quite pronounced information advantages. And sub subvest to get to, uh, to your question is a great case in point. The company is started by Christopher Seabrook, and he listed Sabvest on the J Johannesburg Stock Exchange in the late 1980s. It started with a 
primary asset being a, uh, a textiles, uh, fittings, uh, and fasteners business, doing zippers and linings and uh, buttons and press studs. That, uh, that company uh, was part of, at the time, a very uh, uh, vibrant South African clothing and textiles industry. Over the years, that industry has sort of wound down, and two interesting things have happened in the Sabvest story. The first is Chris Seabrook has successfully migrated the footprint of SA Bias, uh, um, which is the Sabvest clothing and textiles business, from being South African based to being uh, Southeast Asian uh, footprinted. So that's been a successful uh, international migration. And the second is over the years, he's steadily used the cash flow of that initial business to build a portfolio that is, I think, successfully diversified. And the success of that diversification is evidenced by a return on equity over 20, where are we, 30 years of being a listed company, 30 years as a listed company, 22% uh, return on equity. Uh, that's an impressive result in anyone's language. To get to the point of when or why did we invest, uh, a few years back, we followed the company for many years and we have been invested and disinvested at different stages. But about uh, three years ago, you were able to acquire uh, stock in, in Sabvest at 22 Rand a share with an underlying net asset value in our estimate of about 50 Rand a share. So we were paying 40 or 50 cents in the Rand for this fantastic asset, a large part of which was hard currency dollar based earnings, usefully diversified or healthily diversified. Then through the course of the last 12 months, uh, we weren't sure what the catalyst would be uh, in terms of releasing that uh, capital trap. We had some suspicions, and one of those suspicions was a, an illiquidity trap that didn't matter how much you loved the stock, you just couldn't trade it. So it took us a long time to build that position. Uh, but through the course of last year, uh, two things happened, th uh, three things happened. The first was they, uh, th they sold off their uh, international uh, uh, textiles business, uh, fittings uh, and fasteners business, and that released cash flow uh, onto the balance sheet. That was a, a very, uh, I mean, that was a, an impressive corporate event in terms of capital release. The second was a very long-standing shareholder, one of the founding family businesses, released their share block into the market, and that has uh, helped liquidity lift materially. And the third was they used the duality of those two events to buy back some of their own shares with that free cash flow. And that, I think, sent a really clear signal to the market. So with those three events having taken place, the 22 Rand quickly turned into 50 Rand. Um, and we've been thrilled with the, with the result over the last 12 months. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, the gentleman's name, the CEO of Sabvest, I'm sorry, I just... I just Christopher forgot. Seabrook. Christopher Seabrook. He has returned 54 times on capital since 1988. <laughs> and so the parallels are striking. He started with a textile company, a textile business, and he's transitioned out of that through investing and returned 54 times on capital. Sounds very reminiscent of uh, Warren Buffett's own story with Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful um, uh, parallel, and I don't think it's by design. It's just fantastic coincidence. Uh, I, I, in, in, in our opinion, uh, uh, as long-standing shareholders of the business, we regard uh, Chris as one of the shrewdest allocators of capital in South Africa. And despite this extraordinary track record, he remains from an institutional perspective, largely uninvested. Uh, that institutions just don't follow him because he's outside of you know, this top echelon. <laughs> That's very Buffett-like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's, let's talk about uh, uh, telecom. Mm. Well, that's the second stock that, uh, in and out, I, I guess to talk a little bit against myself, Telcom is inside of the top 100. 
uh, telecom is uh, uh, historically uh, South Africa's state-owned telecommunications business. It's an old uh, landline business, copper cabling buried in the ground. With uh, uh, As mobile uh, came into the industry, telecom was one of the uh, one of two companies to get a, a mobile license. The other was a business called MTN. Uh, and over the years, the two of them grew in parallel, building up very successful uh, mobile uh, cellular businesses alongside uh, telecom's landline copper business. Uh, a while back, telecom spun out uh, that mobile business. It's called Vodacom. And so that gave the South African market then three listed telcos, MTN, Vodacom, and, uh, and Telcom, with Telcom sort of overwhelmingly being regarded as the ugly sister uh, in, the, in that trio. You know, it was on the back foot. It was old. Its infrastructure was buried in the ground. Um, there was a lot of net asset value being done on the business to suggest that they had more copper in the ground than their market cap. You know, that was one of the sort of favorite throwaways about uh, about telecom, and uh, uh, there too, you know, we have been invested for for some time, but we were especially intrigued early last year, where uh, telecom was trading at about forty five rand a share, with a market cap of thirty billion rand. It was profitable. Uh, evidenced by a price earnings multiple of seven, a dividend yield of six, and very much a utility-like uh, return on asset and return on equity. So a return on asset of 10, 11%, and a slightly better return on equity because there's some modest gearing in the business. But you know, for all intents and purposes, what you would expect to see from a uh, from a mature utilities business. When when we when we worked on trying to sort of establish the uh, the value of that free cash flow as an operating business, we got to a share price that was a long way north of the 45 rand. We figured it was worth 70 odd rand a share just as an operating business, and that uh, compelled us to you know take a position. What was even more compelling though was in our assessment, in our research, we identified an underlying asset, a property business called uh, Gyro. And that Gyro owns masts and towers as well as telecoms, uh, client service centers, and office buildings. As far as we could establish, nowhere in telecoms valuation was there any recognition of that property asset. And, and to us, that was notable because the insured value of that property asset was 24 billion rand, and Telcom's market cap was 30 billion rand. <laughs> you can, you know, you can do the, uh, the the accounting gymnastics here in a range of ways, but you know, we thought, well, one way of thinking of this is we're going to pay six billion rand for this operating asset. <laughs> uh, that could be one way of looking at it. But you uh, figured it was worth was 70 billion rand. Which we thought was, yeah. Uh, and we, we don't have any insight here. We don't have any fast track or any privileged information. But our suspicion is that much like Vodacom was spun out, uh, that uh, Gyro will be spun out of that uh, holding company. And that that would release, in, in our estimate, you know, anywhere between sort of 20, 30 rand a share. Uh, and we were paying 40 rand uh, just north of 40 rand for the company. So put it all together, uh, 45 rand for a telco, mature, not fast growing, uh, but strong cash flows, dividend paying. We thought that 40 rand, 45 rand was worth 75 or 80 rand, and then add another 20 or 30 rand for the property business. Uh, we saw fantastic uh, uh, upside in it. Uh, thankfully, that... Uh, you know, that hypothesis, that thesis uh, has come to play. And uh, uh, Telcom today is trading on the market at uh, 90 Rand a share. 
having uh, just two days ago released very impressive uh, results. How do you size something like that in your portfolios? With the benefit of hindsight, as big as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Never enough. <laughs> isn't, isn't that the truth? It, it, <laughs> it really does depend on on the mandate that we are building to. So if you know if this is hummingbird, uh, I've said that that name often enough that I guess people uh, tuned in will know that this is one of my favourite uh, portfolios. We're quite comfortable owning ten percent of the portfolio in a single name. If it is a uh, if it's a portfolio where the mandate is grow the capital, don't take outsized risk, then you know we're going to be holding a 20 or perhaps 30 stock portfolio, and our position is going to be a three, maybe a four percent position uh, in those diversified portfolios where the the guidance is initially prudence, and you might be looking after retirement assets uh, or you know pension fund assets, then uh, uh, you have to worry first about capital protection before you worry about capital growth. So we're going to be far more prudent in the size that we take uh, in, a, in a company like Telcom. But what we won't own is we won't own you know, 0.5%. Uh, we just don't see the merit in that. You can't own 0.5% and charge active fees. Uh, so is Superdog's a little bit more systematic and Hummingbird is a little bit more discretionary? Is that And there's so, you do a little bit more work on, on Hummingbird than you do yeah. on a, a Superdog position? I think that's a, that's a fair descriptor. Superdog's is mechanically rebuilt every year. Uh, early January, we screen the entire market. Uh, we exclude resource companies from that screening because of their uh, in, innate cyclicality. Uh, Superdogs then has a universe of financial and industrial companies. The businesses must have been listed for at least three years that we've got sufficient data. They must be profitable. And then we go in search of uh, the metrics that we spoke about earlier. If uh, uh, from that we will build a, for the sake of a number, let's call it a 40 stock portfolio. By convention, we hold three stocks per sector, and the sector is engineering, building, uh, broadcast, insurance, banking. So we'll own three stocks per sector, and that gives us then this very diversified portfolio. Over the years, over the 20-odd years of building Superdogs, it became uh, perhaps beyond coincidence that there were names that just kept being shown to us in the construction uh, of that portfolio. And that, I think if you have an investment curiosity, you're going to roll up your sleeves and go digging. And that has led us to a, a number of really interesting businesses. When we last spoke, I mentioned a company, Indequity, to you, uh, our most recent Ben Graham net net. And where we find those businesses, uh, Superdogs, you know, if it's a 40 stock portfolio, you're going to have 2% of the portfolio exposed to it. Hummingbird wants 10. Uh, and so we will roll up our sleeves. We'll engage with management. We'll do deep due diligence on the business. Uh, not to, uh, I guess, you know, sort of uh, speak lightly of our super dogs or other processes where the dil diligence is robust. But you know, if you're building a 10-stock portfolio, you have to do just that much more. And the way that we... So speak about this amongst ourselves is we regard a hummingbird as listed private equity, that we want to invest in this business as if we owned the entire business for a very, very long time. Uh, and so hummingbird is far more active, far more intimate, and our holding periods are much, much longer in there. Hummingbird is still a young portfolio. It's been around for six years now. Um, and in that time, we've turned over 15% of the portfolio. So we're very comfortable, you know, buying these stocks and owning them as if we're going to own them forever. So tell us a little bit about Indequity, because that was one that was, it was a fascinating discussion yesterday. Yeah. So it's a genuine nano cap. And we should point out that the RAND is, there's about 15 RAND to the dollar. But uh, I, I do love this story. And I love the fact that you know it so well, even though you're, 
you're, you're, you're, you're CEO of Canon and you, you, you're all over this tiny nano cap. <laughs> yeah, we, we own a, a reasonable stake in this business now. Uh, we have been invested for a long time. Indequity, when we most recently uh, increased our, our, our investment in the business, had a, a market cap of uh, just over 30 million rand. That makes it tiny. You know, that's a in two dollar million terms. US, right. Two million dollar. <laughs> you corrected me yesterday when I said, you know, no one listening to this is going to be interested. And you said, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. All the deep value yeah, guys listen we'll to be, this. This is this uh, is what you get yeah. for, for for staying to the to the end of the podcast. You get a South <laughs> African nano cap that's genuinely yeah. undervalued. So Indequity has, uh, when we raised our stake recently, market cap of just over 30 million rand. On the balance sheet, uh, 40 million rand in cash, no debt. And then along with the 40 million rand in cash, a 1.2 million US dollar listed equity portfolio. So that 1.2 million US dollar is another 15 or 16 million rand. Uh, add the cash and the listed portfolio together. And you've got uh, 55 million rand in a highly liquid uh, daily priced assets, cash and listed equity. The market cap is just north of 30 million rand, no debt on the balance sheet. In addition, uh, the company is profitable. Uh, its most recent uh, earnings, 13 million. So you're paying 30 million for 13 million in earnings. That's you know two or three uh multiple on earnings and dividend paying and that dividend translated into about a 10 percent uh, dividend yield to add to all of this the, our frustration is lack of liquidity uh, and the executive the board is frustrating us further by acquiring and canceling their own shares <laughs> now, you know it immediately you know goes, well how am i ever going to realize value and quite honestly you know if the if the investment horizon in hummingbird is five or ten or you know forever then why do we want to realize uh, the capital we want this beautiful little business just to keep powering away, generating the earnings, and uh, returning those earnings to us in the form of dividend. And uh, another way in which you return earnings is you buy back and cancel shares. Uh, it's no different to a very handsome dividend. So uh, Much more tax uh, efficient. Been, and much more tax efficient. So they've been buying back and canceling their own shares, which does leave you with a liquidity problem. We'll live with that liquidity problem. Uh, and um, uh, from where we made our most recent acquisition uh, at, at about three rand a share, that share price has set up quite smartly. It's now trading at around six rand a share. So the market cap has repriced. Even at these levels, you know, we think that it is worth substantially more. Just the insurance license carries, uh, carries value. Forget about the rest. In some of that marketing collateral you sent through to me, just to just to change gears slightly, you had you had a fascinating chart showing uh, mean reversion in the return on invested capital of many of the companies in the South African stock market. So let's just describe that chart for us, please. The the chart is one of the tools that we use to. Or, or the, the evidence in that chart is one of the tools that we use to help us think about how to value a business. Many times, most of the time, businesses are valued as if they're going to uh, sustain their recent record. And if that recent record is disappointing, then you know this is a business that's in trouble. It's going to into the death zone. Or if it's a business that in the recent past has generated impressive results, uh, the industry habit uh, is to sort of uh, straight line those in Excel uh, styled fashion. And what the evidence, the South African evidence points to is a very powerful force called mean reversion. <laughs> and that businesses that have acceptable balance sheets and viable models, if they are in a tough patch now, the throwaway is this too shall pass. Uh, you know, and how long does it take for this too uh, to pass? 
about three years and mean reversion has, has kicked in. In the, by the same convention, businesses that have demonstrated impressive recent performance give up that record within the next three years or so. So you have this uh, convergence back to the mean, uh, both in the laggards and the stars, uh, both of them converting to the mean within sort of a three or four year period. And if you push this further, five, six, seven years, once you're out at five, six, seven years, almost your entire universe is doing little more than uh, returning uh, a, a cost of capital. So your return on invested capital for the market as a whole, unsurprisingly, is about your weighted cost of capital. Yeah, I, lo I, love, um, <clears throat> I love that finding because it's, I, I have that chart from Michael Mabison that I put up in a lot of my presentations and a lot of my books yeah. that shows an identical... Sorry, I'm interrupting you, no, but no, it please. was his research that, that, that sparked us to do the exact same thing for South Africa. And well, I wonder if that's here. And absolutely, it's and, here. And p perhaps even more so for some reason, it's, it really stands out in that chart that mean reversion is a real phenomenon. Yeah. And I could give you, you know, in the current conversation, I could give you many names that in the last uh, five or six years have gone from being absolute superstars a few years ago. Uh, if you ask the sort of the on the street investor, what should you own? They would have given you names like MediClinic and Netcare and Mr. Price. And these businesses in the last two or three years, this mean reversion has really kicked in. And I'm not I hope I'm not saying that in a gleeful way. You know, you don't want bad things to happen to anyone's investment or business, but it's a really healthy reminder that uh, that stardom is is hard to to find and even harder to retain. Um, you're uh, you're a professor of economics at the University of Pretoria, and this is no adjunct professorship. You're a, you've won multiple awards for for teaching over a very long period of time. How do you uh, how do you juggle both, and what do you take from uh, the academic side into your into your investing, and vice versa? Toby, I think I'm incredibly privileged to be able to uh, to do both of these things. Uh, it's I don't think I'm unique. Uh, you know, I can think of a number of other people in international markets who are able to sort of look after two two mandates. The, the simple reality is these two mandates feed each other in a, in a very rich way. And what I'll find in, in the business school classroom, so my professorship is uh, University of Pretoria, but it is uh, part of the Gordon Institute of Business Science, which is a business school. Uh, and in any one year, I will have 300, 350 uh, business school students who are in their 20s and 30s and if you want a demanding, challenging audience uh, who want to interrogate and due diligence your process, <laughs> there they are. Uh, so they, you know, it's a it's a fantastic environment to uh, to be challenged, uh, to be kept up to date, uh, to be reminded that we have never perfected this. That investing is is it's a it's an ongoing learning process. It's a safe environment in which you can share experiences, uh, uh, learn from successes as well as mistakes, and you know the two feed each other in a wonderful uh, ebb and flow. Uh, we're, we're coming up on our time, Adrian. Uh, if folks want to get in contact with you, what's the best way of doing that? I know you've got a Twitter. You're on Twitter, and uh, yeah, so on. Probably the easiest way, and I think, in fact, that's how uh, you know we initially engaged was on Twitter. It was just to use my Twitter handle. It's my name, uh, at Adrian Saville, uh, A-D-R-I-A-N-S-A-V-I-L-L-E. Uh, otherwise, you can find uh, us on uh, our business uh, Twitter handle, which is at Canon Assets. Canon is C-A-N-N-O-N. Assets is plural. Uh, or uh, pop me an email, uh, adrian at canonassets.co.za. Uh, and if you find me through any one of those channels, I'd love to engage. And I'll make sure that all of that's in the show notes to this show, including the uh, 
the 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 research that you've done at the the marketing collateral that we were discussing earlier. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Adrian Savile. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It's great being with you. Thank you for having uh, me on your show, and uh, I value the time with you. My pleasure.